I'm Holly Herrick from Austin Film Society, and I'm here with um, two of my favorite filmmakers, and I'll have them introduce themselves. <laughs> I'm Channing Godfrey Peoples. I'm the writer director of Miss Juneteenth. Uh, I'm Neil Creaky Williams, and I am uh, one of the producers of Miss Juneteenth. Thank you guys so much for doing the Q&A with us. We're so excited to be hosting the film. It's been a long road since we first started talking with you about Miss Juneteenth a couple of years ago, and we first read the script. Um, and it's when we talked just about around the beginning of the release, it was shocking that you were sort of releasing this film in the middle of a pandemic. And now the film, weeks later, is coming out during a historic turning point for civil rights in Black America. And I wonder, wonder just how you're feeling about that since we haven't caught up about that. I mean, it's been interesting, you know, for me, it's um, bittersweet in the, in a way because um, we had the film that we made is really a um, film that is shining a light on a community that's not often seen. And so, you know, one of the things that I really wanted to be I wanted the film to be seen in the theater just for the communal aspect because, and I also wanted the community to have access to the film, you know, especially the community that I made the film in, you know, um, I really, um, as far as the things that are happening right now in America, it's, I feel like it's a bittersweet moment for the film to be coming out. Um, you know, I feel it's, we're at a time where, this awful tragedy and series is, series of tragedies really have created a space in which black voices are being amplified. And so, you know, my hope in this story coming out at this time um, will just contribute to more black voices being heard. And I don't just mean in the cinema space, I mean like the activists and community leaders, the legislators, like the people who are on the ground making a difference. Yeah, I'm, I'm so, um it's really amazing to hear you talk about how the movie shines a light in a community that hasn't been seen because just it, it, knowing Texas film, it really hasn't, you know, like the, the, the black community in Fort Worth, there isn't another film um, that we can pinpoint. And, and it's so lived in, which is what critics keep sort of loving about the film. Um, and it also says a lot um, about structural racism without, you speaking through the film. And so can you talk sort of about what was important to you to convey about a community that hadn't ever really been um, in Hollywood per se, or in uh, really seen on screen? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, like um, growing up in this community, and I'd love to get your perspective too on this, Neil, because <laughs> I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas, and Neil, you know, I, I dragged down to Texas. He's a North Carolinian. <laughs> but, um, you know, one of the things about this community, and I just want to highlight where it is, it's um, the south side of Fort Worth, um, which is now called the historic south side of Fort Worth. And it really is a, um, a community that at one time was fruitful for Black businesses and Black commerce and, you know, just a... Um, really strong um, black community. And today it's just like holding on to the places and the spaces that have been in these families for generations. And um, so you go there and, um, you know, you described it, I think, as everything. I mean, it feels lived in, but everything, you know, I think you were saying it feels like everything's past its expiration. Now. Yeah, it was. I mean, you know, I'm not from Texas, so, and I'm not from Fort Worth, so it was different for me. I was like coming in with outsider eyes and I, I felt that Fort Worth, a lot of the areas we were in, especially the South side, like people would hang on to things when most folks would have maybe let them go. Like mm -hmm. they, there was a grit to like mm -hmm. keeping the truck, you know, even if it's not working, like you have someone who can fix it and it kind of, mm -hmm. it kind of works. Like you piece it together, you know? And right. um, I thought that was really a thing that made the place special, you know, because there was a texture and a mm -hmm. care for everything, you know? And I, I thought that's something that you know, Channing would tell all of the crew and cast, that's how we're gonna approach the production design, the sound, you know, everything, like kind of this mm -hmm. worn, worn look and worn feel. Because we really were um, approaching the film in the sense that, you know, I think as a director, as a writer director, I'm always looking for the truth anyway. And um, authenticity is one of the most important things to me. And so I wanted to represent the community in 
as an authentic way as possible. You know, I really feel like having grown up in the community, I see it with this, um, I just saw it, you know, with this beauty. And I think that the community has this, this it, the people are, they have this grit about them. They have this sense of resilience, right. you know? And um, I wanted to be able to um, show that in the film. Well, congratulations, because I think you completely achieved that. It, it shines through the, the place, the feeling. Um, and it's just, you feel like you can just step into the shoes of Turquoise, who's played by Nicole Bahari. Um, and I think her, her performance is such a credit to your work there for us for creating that world in which we're, we're sort of fully immersed. So I wanted you to talk a little bit more. I'm so glad you talked about the, the production design and the tone and um, the, the actors are so much a part of that. So, the, and with the brilliant, brilliant casting. So can you talk a little bit more about, about who they are and, um, and how, how that approach for authenticity um, led you to that cast? I mean, turquoise, we were always, um, I was terrified about casting turquoise, partially because I had such an attachment to her. You know, I'd been with the script for so long and, you know, we knew that that role was going to require someone who could navigate, you know, this emotional journey that turquoise takes in the film. And um, she's navigating just like her um, disappointments in life, you know, um, her lost dream. She's navigating like, love, the love for her daughter and, you know, the sense of joy um, that she feels for her daughter and just wanting her daughter to have the best life. And so we really were looking for someone who could um, bring that nuance to this role. And I think for me, as a um, director, I've discovered that I really love for actors to be able to sit in moments. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to it's going to take me a minute to call cut because <laughs> I just want them to be um, walking and talking in the character. And, you know, sometimes something magic will happen even after, you know, all the lines are said, you know? And so um, for me, Nicole is a brilliant actor who could bring that nuance to the role. And um, she definitely did. And beyond that, I think, you know, that just everybody who surrounds her seems to, to, you know, the, the energy and the, and the dynamics between the cast just are, are, are working so brilliantly. And I know that um, the, the woman who plays her daughter is a, is a newcomer. Right? Yeah, Alexis Chiesa, um is, this is her first movie role. <laughs> and, um, you know, I was terrified because I was just like, you know, I have a theater background and, and I understand what it is to work with actors who, you know, have tons of experience and have been on stage and, you know, have been in, who, who've worked a lot, you know, and um, I, you know, you, you all like knew right away. You were like, she's amazing. Like yeah. she's it, you know, but it took me, it didn't take me long because I saw how special she was in the audition. I just wanted to make sure that I could, you know, do everything that I needed to do as a director to bring this authentic performance, you know, with her being a new performer. And that was silly for me to even think because she was just fantastic and, you know, fell into the role and um, grabbed it and wouldn't let it go. Like I had this, I always had this idea of um, a poetic tone and I wanted to mimic the pace of the community that I was making the film, you know, it has this timeless quality. And she fell into like tone and pace immediately. Like we went through the script together before we shot. And I just, you know, explained to her how I saw the film and I always approach acting in this really naturalistic way. And um, I wanted people listening to each other and talking to each other in as most, in as most a human way as possible. And she just fell in and killed it. Yeah. And, and the relationship with the dad is I think particularly special. Um, and I, I, I just, you. <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, it, I just love how there is um, not really a playbook into how the relationships are constructed. It's really organic to, to the characters themselves, which is something I think so much cinema tries to do, but fails to do. And it's amazing when it's, it works the way it works in Miss Juneteenth. I mean, I love that. Cause like, I think for me as an artist, like I really, 
I don't, I'm not seeing everyone in black and white. You know, I have to be constantly looking at folks in shades of gray. And um, I really feel like even in casting Kendrick Sampson, who is, um, who plays the dad, Ronnie, um, he's from Houston, Texas. Right. And so, you know, that was the bonus because he can walk and talk, you know, as a Texan. And there's is obviously different, you know, <laughs> Fort Worth has a different accent than, you know, Houston does. But he came in and he listened to, you know, um, local folks and was able to pick things up super quickly. And he's also someone that I think can deliver the kind of nuance that I was talking about with these other two actors. And um, he really, um, I, I feel like he approached Ronnie in this way that was even, I think, more magical than I imagined, you right. know. And I feel like we really got this honest, authentic performance from him. Definitely. Oh, you absolutely do did um, from the audience perspective. So I, 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 this is, you've been in LA, you've worked in Hollywood, you've went to school out there, made, made work out there. Um, is there, but this film clearly is all about Texas and that's both for the environment and, and for where you're living. Um, is, can you talk a little bit about why regional cinema is important to you um, and sort of what the difference would be if you were to try to make something like this out there? I mean, it, it was it was vital for me because it was my life experience, you know, on film in so many ways. And like it's something as special as Juneteenth, which is absolutely, you know, is focused regionally. I mean, it's celebrated in how many other places? 47 states, I think. Right. It's celebrated mm -hmm. when, in all these other states. You know, Neil does all this research. <laughs> um, but it's specific in Texas, you know, this is where it started. And so had I not had, you know, the support of, you know, places of, of you know, being here, making a film here in Texas and organizations like the Austin Film Society, you know, I wouldn't have been able to make the film in this way. Like it was a game changer for us, I think, um, especially saying that we wanted to make a film about this specific place. And Sometimes you hear things like, you know, we've heard things like the film is, you know, well, the film is narrow, the film is not as accessible, you know, which is like, no, you know, the fact that it's more specific can make it more, you know, accessible to people because you're seeing all these universal themes in a new world. Definitely. Yeah. It, it's so interesting too that it's coming out on a Juneteenth that's like, for so many people, well, well, so much of white America ignored Juneteenth for forever. And now it seems like people are talking about it and know what it is. Um, and so it's exciting that the movie can add a layer, I think, for people. Um, did, you did, you, did you expect people who were not sort of from the Black Texas community to know about Miss Juneteenth when you made the movie? And um, do you have any expectations there? I mean, I know it's hard to have expectations for white people have ignored this for hundreds of years. But. <laughs> I, I didn't expect people to know just because I started making the film because um, when I went up to graduate school in California, you know, I would say every year, happy Juneteenth, you know, on June 19th, so people would go around and wave and folks, and people would look at me like, what? And so, you know, I didn't have the expectation that people really would know, part partially because when we were pitching the film, you remember when we were pitching, like, we always have to start the pitch with yeah. before Juneteenth uh, were? Yeah, for, like, the first few years, we always had to, like, take a few minutes and explain, this is what Juneteenth is. It's a holiday. And one way that people celebrate Juneteenth is this pageant. And it was, you know, I mean, I yeah, think... That was it, literally the start of every pitch. At one point, I think Blackish made, did something so we could mm -hmm. refer to Blackish, which was helpful. But for the most part, it was just but it, like... But it, it still wasn't, you know, the way that we were... Not the way we were, yeah. Not right, the way we were they approaching were, it. they were, you know, celebrating Juneteenth on this show or commemorating, right. but we were talking about a very, Juneteenth in a very specific place when right. we talk about regional cinema, you know. Right. Um, and so we'd have to, you know, paint the picture of, of even if people were familiar and had heard it on that show or, or other media, you know, we were still saying this is how they do this in Texas because, you know, right. we're commemorating the fact that the slaves in Texas didn't find out they were free till two and a half years after everyone else, you know, and 
you know, one special thing was when we were making the film, there's an existing location in the film called the um, Juneteenth Museum. Right. And Neil and I got very close to the curator, um, this wonderful man who plays himself basically named Don Williams. And um, when we took the script to him and said, oh, here are your lines. We want to make sure this feels authentic to you. And the line is, um, you know, there's like, once they found out they were free, this joyful celebration in the street. And he just let me know. He said, I just want to tell you that it was cautious celebration, you know, because they still, there was, you know, this belief that they weren't even really free. Right. You know, they're just hearing this. So, you know, I'm constantly and consistently learning things about it myself. You know, we're filmmakers, not historians, but we wanted to be in a position to open a window for people to be interested in Juneteenth and, you know, start learning more about it. And I will say, as someone from North Carolina, like we, I knew of Juneteenth before I came out here um, to Texas, but I didn't know all the ways it was celebrated. And so what's been interesting too, in talking to people who've seen the film or knew about Juneteenth, they're like, hey, I, I didn't know there was a pageant, you know? So it's really yeah. cool to, to, you know, bring this kind of like history and pageant, Texas kind of culture into the movie. Mm -hmm. it's, it's such a rich theme though, because I think Juneteenth in general and the way that it's been treated or the way that it's been, you know, known and so deeply important, but yet, you know, lots of society, particularly white society is not aware of it. And it's sort of like the symbolic of the, you know, the history being oppressed and, and suppressed. Um, and I think that it's, it, it has this way of sort of permeating other aspects of, of the story in the film. Um, I think that are, are very poetic and 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 profound and um i just you know want to congratulate you guys on on what you accomplished here with the you know the incredible resourcefulness to make the film um such a beautiful film um so my, realizing really your vision channing from from the outset it's really exciting so um so in, and this is sort of a question for both of you but i'm hoping neil can respond to you that you know this is the independent film is changing all the time. Clearly the pandemic has been sort of incredibly disruptive. Um, but what do you feel like, you know, having, having just made the film and premiered it at Sundance right before all of this happened, um, what are your feelings about kind of independent film right now and where it's going? And um, what are you guys thinking about in terms of the future of, of our field and what we're up to? <laughs> well, before the pandemic, it was interesting because I, it just, you know, I think our industry is always changing, right? But I, I felt at Sundance that, you know, we had gotten to a point where all the big players, maybe like the streamers and all those distributors were really making what would have just been called independent films. Like they're making those now as opposed to like mm -hmm. maybe even acquiring them, um, like, you know, two, three years ago. So that was interesting, right? Um, and I think the question I'm hearing on the community of like other producers is that like what does life look like now after the pandemic, if that's where we were before? And, you know, people are worried about funding. Our projects are going to come back now that, you know. So I think we're in a place where we're always, like, trying to figure it out. But I also, I'm hopeful because I just think that, like, when you hit these kind of moments where you're like, I'm not sure what's going to happen, there's always, like, something new that kind of yeah. kicks a whole new way of looking at problems and solving them. And we may come back, and because of virtual cinemas, like, people are totally fine to see a bunch of films, you know, in virtual cinemas, like, you know, AFS or, or even VOD. And like, that may be like the new saving grace for independent cinema going forward. I don't know. It's pretty cool. What do you what think, think Janet? <laughs> <laughs> I know we won't wait as long next time, you know, yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> because I mean, we couldn't, we definitely couldn't imagine any of this, you know, to be honest. I, I literally last year we had a um we have a she's 22 months about yeah, to be 20, 23 20 months. months and yeah. so our baby turned one on set and I just remember last year you know when we were making the movies like we were making the movie like I was a new mom and I was terrified you know I had made a short we made a short together earlier that January, year right. and she was much younger than maybe four or five months or something like right. that maybe more than that but I mean, she wasn't that old. And then when we had her you know, on this Juneteenth, you know, it was even a longer stretch. So um, I remember saying, why are we doing this? 
this summer. I was like, why are we doing this? You know, like we just had this baby. We were insane, you know, yeah. getting up at like, I don't know, three, three in the morning. Usually like morning. two hours before call time. So yeah, like three in the morning, four in the morning, like, like I was food washing, uh, right. Stuff. Prepping food, yeah. like washing pump parts. Like it's crazy. It was insane, you know, and um, I had to take my little baby out the door because we, we, you know, made a little room for her at the production yeah, the, office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I just remember saying, why are we doing this right now? And <laughs> I just can't imagine if we hadn't, we wouldn't be shooting this year, you know. Yeah, so yeah. I know one thing it's taught me is, is, you know, we absolutely have to continue to nurture the stories in the same way, but we just can't be as precious about time, you know. I mean, that's just me uh, having an epiphany here. I, everything happens in this time, I guess, you know? I don't know. I can't really say. <laughs> that was very wise. Lots of wisdom there. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I, I would have come to that before the pandemic. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Well, um, well, you guys, it's um, I know you've got back-to-back -back interviews, and I appreciate you taking the time with with AFS to give a special special Q and A for our our crew. And um, congratulations on making this movie in Texas with all Texas people, and um, it's amazing. So we're so happy to and honored to host it. Congratulations to you, Holly, and congratulations to AFS, because I hope you can see through Miss Juneteenth um, what a difference you all are making um, in, bringing to these story, in bringing these stories that might not be seen, you know, into the world. So we're really grateful to you and have a lot of love and, um, you know, talk about our time with you all with fondness and no one can believe that um, Charles Burnett was really in my orbit because of AFS. Can I shout out? I know we're in Texas, so yes. can I just shout out some of my producing partners like yes. Sarah Bear, James Toby, uh, Jeannie. Uh, Igo came from Ireland, but she produced the movie. We were financed by Leyline, the Texas company, Teresa Page. Teresa Steele Page. Teresa Steele Thank Page, you. yes. So I don't know. I just wanted to make sure. Yes. That this is a Texas, feel, yeah, Texas right. production. Yes, it is through and through. Through and through. Texas so, film. yeah. Awesome. Super Thank grateful. You guys. Um, all right. We'll see you next time.